guys, look at this. How incredible. It's a black mamba and a huge one. Awesome stuff. That is so cool. As we came round the corner, he reared up in the road in front of us and we got to see the black mouth as he hissed. Look at this. One of the most awesome snake species out here. There you can see that shape of the head. So typical of the black mamba species. Called black mamba because the inside of their mouth is totally black, seeking refuge in the tree. The most, one of the most venomous and awe-inspiring predators out here. Packs a powerful, powerful neurotoxic venom. And I can see it moving through. This is incredible. You can hear one of the bird species furiously alarm calling. Look at the way it's lifting its body up. When we came around this corner, it lifted two thirds of its body and flared the slight hood that it has. Wow. This is one of my most incredible sights. And look at it, look at it extending its body. That is such strength reaching up into the bush willow. Oh, that is incredible. Look how long it is. Two meters easily. Six feet of pure muscle. What an incredible, incredible moment. Yo, my heart's beating quite fast, actually. <laughs> There's nothing like having a snake rear up at your bonnet in surprise, but all that was, they have this terrible reputation of being aggressive snakes. And yes, to an extent, but the only reason he reared up at us is because he felt threatened. You can see that smooth scale, that olive color, and the black dots on his belly. He's starting to calm down. Oh, I hope Cheesy Cheetah is watching. Look at that. Coiled, ready to spring. What a beautiful animal. An aerial, yes, they are. Um, they're not poisonous. Poisonous is when something is eaten and has a toxic effect. They are venomous, which means they inject or bite poison. They've got powerful front-facing fangs. And you're looking at one of the most venomous snakes that we have in South Africa. One of the top six most deadly species. That being said, one that is incredibly beautiful. So the venom is neurotoxic. It attacks the nervous system of the species that it, and its prey species. Wow, look at the way it's bobbing, using that flickering sensory tongue to guide its movements. are breathtakingly beautiful. So essentially within South Africa itself, we have a couple of really deadly snake species. This is one of the top deadly ones. And it can kill a grown man in the space of about 20 minutes after the bite, unless a person is given urgent medical attention. That being said, you don't understand how rare bites actually are. 90% or somewhere around that statistic, about 90% of snake bites that happen, happen with people either trying to play with or catch and remove these deadly creatures. And you should never ever try and catch a snake unless you know exactly what you're doing. And they've got this awesome and terrifying reputation, which you can understand, but it comes from people interfering with them. And now you can see how relaxed the snake is in our presence. And Kevin, you want to know how close we are. We're far enough away that I feel comfortable. It does happen that you occasionally surprise them in the road. Tibbs is gonna just give you a rough idea since he's not gonna disappear just yet. Um, and if we zoom out, you can see we're probably about, what would that be, about five meters away 
from the start of the car. So we're sitting here, he's sitting comfortably in a tree there. And I've given him plenty of space to feel comfortable. We didn't when we first came around the corner. That's the thing about live safaris, as we always say. There's, there's that tip of the tail. So he reared up in fright and gave us quite an aggressive response, but that was just fear. Look at that incredible head shape. Ah, oh, so exciting. This is the best black mamba sighting I think I've ever had. And Vanessa, I'm not sure. I actually think that he came out to bask in the morning light. He wanted, Vanessa wants to know if he was after something. Could be, it could well be that we interrupted some kind of hunt, but I think generally when a snake is stretched across the middle of the road as he was, it's because they're looking for warmth. So as ectotherms, they're reliant on the external temperature to moderate their body temperature. Look at that power. It doesn't look like he's eaten recently. There's no strange bulges that would indicate a recent meal. Now that snake is longer than I am tall. In fact, I'm fairly certain it's longer than Brent is tall. And pure muscle. Look at the way it guides its head forward holding up its body weight. You can see the slight hood. No. <laughs> Gerard, you are absolutely right. Not a snake we want to find in our kitchen. I know that many of you have been updated as to the saga of the spitting cobra that was spotted on the microwave of our camp. They are lightning fast, as are all snakes. Their speed is not to be underestimated. Their reflexes are not to be underestimated. That being said, as I mentioned, it's purely a fear response that causes them to lash out at people. And it's actually incredibly unusual for a person to be bitten. It does happen. It is one of those aspects of life out in the bush and I'm sure if there are any viewers in Australia, you're also very familiar with the more deadly type of snakes that occasionally... Oh, he's got an injury there. What is that? There's some kind of puncture wound there on his side. You can see the smoothness of the... ...tails. I love snakes. I think they're extraordinary creatures. Absolutely, Janet. What? <laughs> Janet, who's watching in Canada, Janet's going to be paying us a visit soon, coming across to Voyatella, which is the lodge on Juma where we operate. And Janet, you're wondering who's going to make sure that there, he isn't a companion in your room. It definitely is, by the way, Janet, the best mamba sighting I've ever had in my life, actually. So I'm glad that you're enjoying it. And don't worry, there are plenty of staff members that double-check the rooms beforehand. There are screens all across to keep them out. And again, very, very unusual to find them in human habitation. They're actually terrified of people. I mean, this, this is unusual, to see a black mamba of this size. And there you go, Wicked Blue Band. You wanted to know how rare this is. Well, this is the first time I've ever had a black mamba sighting like this. Usually they are over in a split second as the snake dashes into the hole or a termite mound or a log or something. And obviously you don't go trying to play with black mambas to try and see them again. So to have this opportunity to really study the snake in motion is, it's a first for me, and I've been out here years in the bush. Very, very unusual in a black mamba's case. You get to see puff adders, which are slightly more slow, or boom slungs. And 
Miss Susan, you were wondering how far it could lunge if it wanted to. And virtual tourist, you were saying, how fast can it lunge? Um, because it makes you a little bit nervous. In terms of how far it can lunge, it can lift up about two thirds of its body weight and strike forwards. I can't remember the exact speed, but I can say that it's faster than any kind of lightning reaction that we might have. Luckily, my foot came down on the brake very quickly because I would hate to have injured the snake, which is what we would have done, which is why it reared up in the first place in terms of... But we've not given the snake any reason to strike. We've also given it plenty of space now. It's moved off into the safety of this tree. It's still slightly flared around the neck, which I think is either in response to us or to some other kind of threat. I haven't seen any birds mobbing it. So I think it's still feeling slightly unsettled at our presence, but it's relaxed enough to be in that particular bush willow and not to have escaped off. In terms of the potency of the venom, Margaret wants to know which is worse. Is it a, a cobra or a mamba? And the answer is the mamba's venom is more deadly and it actually acts faster. The differences with cobras is they tend to come into contact with people more frequently. But again, when I say more frequently, I'm not saying this is a, cur a, a common occurrence at all. And it's only really where food has attracted rodents and rodents therefore have attracted the snake itself. Um, and the other thing of course with cobras, especially spitting cobras, is that as their name suggests, they spit. So their venom can actually travel further than this black mamba can strike. And it contains both neurotoxic and cytotoxic, so cell destroying aspects to it. And they have incredibly well practiced aim. It's always important that you make sure you've got your eyes protected if you ever encounter a spitting cobra. Now, if you ever come around the corner and you find yourself faced with a rearing black mamba as we did, your best approach, or a rearing spitting cobra, your best approach is to remain absolutely still. If you're far enough away, so if you're more than, for example, I would say about six feet away from the snake itself you can try and back off give it as much space as possible so that you don't provoke any kind of aggression towards you out of fear and 99.9% .9 of the time the snake is want to is going to want to move away from you you just want to make sure that you don't corner it or threaten it in any way this is incredible I have never had a black mamba sighting like this in my life the, ca the camera's gonna wobble a bit because since we started this sighting, I've had my foot on the brake and I haven't actually let the vehicle relax into the clutch. So you're gonna get a bit of a jolt. There you go. <laughs> because my right leg is now cramping. <laughs> Instinctive foot on brake response. And Monkey Man and Ian, you're both sort of wondering a bit about the size. So I would say that the snake is two meters long. It's coiled up in the tree at the moment, but when it was spread out earlier, it looked to be about six feet or two meters in length from tip of tail to tip of snout. It is one of the biggest black mambas I have seen, which makes it absolutely stunning. Not many of them get to survive to this incredibly incredible size. In terms of diameter, I'm trying to think of a nice comparison for you. Apart from my skinny wrist, which is about how thick it is, at its thickest point. Let me try and, yeah, let me try and give you a perspective, Tebs, if we can zoom out. I'll give you a rough idea in terms of my hands. So, Ian, at its thickest point, it's probably about close to the size of a tennis ball is maybe the nearest comparison I could give. That would be at its widest point, which is in the center of its body and pure muscle. No, sorry, Tez, you can go back. I'm, I'm done with my scale comparison. Just ducking my head out of the way. The strength of that body when it moved across, first of all, when it reared up in front of us, and second of all, when it moved into the tree. 
is breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking. Now, we don't know if it was out hunting or if it was basking, but if it was hunting, searching for some kind of meal, as I said, it doesn't look as though it's eaten recently. Kathy, you were wondering what do black mumbas eat? And anything from rodents to birds, which is why they quite often get mobbed, although very carefully, by the bird species out here. They can eat birds. They, they will raid nests if they can. They will eat amphibians like frogs. And obviously for those tiny animals, an injection of that venom is almost an instant death. It's actually a fairly merciful one. The animal goes straight into paralysis and probably straight into shock as well for small animals of that size. Now the nice thing about mumbers of this length and this maturity is that they've got incredible control over their venom glands. So for a snake, producing venom is something obviously that their body has to put physical effort into. But quite often when they strike, when they are this size, because of the control that they have over the amount of venom they secrete, they will give you what's known as a dry bite if you are incredibly unfortunate and do get bitten. They do often dry bite, which is almost like a warning and a way for them to not waste their venom. And actually the more dangerous ones to catch are the babies that have no control over the amount of venom they produce. And Bethany, these snakes are incredibly comfortable in trees but they generally hunt on the ground it's more common to see them on the ground you wanted to know if it's in the tree because of us yes i think it is in the tree because of us if i'm honest although it might be getting a nice perspective in the world hello yes hello <laughs> yes you're beautiful looking at us through the branches bethany i think it is at this point in the tree because of us and once we finish with the sighting, what I'll do is I'll back off and give it plenty of space to decide where it wants to go from here. It would probably be more at home hiding in a termite mound or a termite. Or underneath a log. And I think the surprise of our arrival confused it a little bit. But because what was interesting was when we first arrived, it and it moved away from us, when we first went live with this, it slithered straight over a termite hole that it could have escaped into. I'm not sure why that was. I don't know if it was just slightly panicked at our presence, felt scared. But once we have finished off with the sighting, then I will give it plenty of space to decide where it wants to go. A snake like this is to be absolutely treated with respect. Both Joseph and Mauricio were wondering if it has any kind of enemies. And Steve and Jenny, you've actually put your finger on one such enemy. Yes, a honey badger will tackle a black mamba, although it will do so with severe caution. As you know, honey badgers tend to have quite a resistance to the venom of, black, of various snakes. Many of you will have seen that incredible clip of the honey badger that takes on, I think it's a cobra, and gets bitten, goes to sleep for a while, and then wakes up and eats the snake that it managed to kill. So they are phenomenal creatures in that respect, definitely with more resistance to the venom than we have. Other enemies it might have would be one of the eagle species. 
especially snake eagles that are specially adapted. That's why snake eagles don't have feathers on their feet. One of the, the reasons that biologists have suggested that snake eagles don't have feathers on their feet because they've specialized in hunting snakes so they can extend their feet and be able to look down on them. And then the one big enemy that we don't see that commonly here, but that we definitely could, is a secretary bird. A big tall bird, close to a meter and a half in height, with long, long bald legs that are equipped with powerful talons as a way of kicking and grabbing at snakes. And they are specialized snake hunters. I'll show you a picture when we've finished off with our snake sighting. This is just too amazing an opportunity to pass up. she I've kept referring to him as a he but to be completely honest I have no idea and Bob G you were wondering if there's any way to determine the sex of a snake and no with mumbas and cobras and all of the um, newly evolved snakes or more advanced snakes so not like a python which is one of the oldest species of snake that we might get out here which I'll get back to in a moment but Bob there's no way without examining the cloaca or the opening which is sits about two-thirds along the tail on the underbelly without being able to observe that opening you wouldn't be able to tell the difference and even then for both males and females their genitals are enclosed within that cloaca so it would be short of catching the snake and having a closer look or examining it under different conditions we wouldn't be able to tell. They have no um, external dimorphism and there's no real link between size and gender. And one extraordinary thing to continue on with the discussion about the genitals is Nikki was wondering how snakes mate. And in, this, in the case of black mummers, it's one of the most extraordinary spectacles to witness, especially with a snake of this size. And I wish, I don't have the picture on my phone anymore, but I've seen the most amazing photographs. What they do is they wrap themselves together. The male places his sexual organs or the opening for his sexual organs over the females. And they have penises that can invert themselves and then penetrate the female very unusual to see it can be quite a long process it can be quite a an involved process their courtship is also almost like a dance as they wrap themselves around each other and just an interesting aside is that not all snakes lay eggs i know that you're saying that most of them do you are absolutely right most of them do but some snakes are what is known as oh hold on a second the brain has to work here oviviparous now what that means is that the, use, the youngsters develop in eggs within the, pre, the mother and then actually hatch before they are born I'm fairly certain I need to brush up on this now and of course my brother would know he, he was the snake expert in our family um, I'm pretty sure puff adders are oviviparous I could stand corrected on this for mumbers they, are, they do lay eggs as far as I know you have to double check that though. I can't remember now which, off the top of my head, which snake species are lay eggs versus giving birth to live young. from Jim and why when we're looking at a gray snake or a sort of an olivey gray snake do I keep referring to it as a black mamba why is it called a black mamba and the answer to that is what we Tebs and I got to see which none of you did 
was as it raised and flared that slight hood and opened its mouth to hiss at us as we came around the corner, the inside of their mouth is pitch black, which is a very, very intimidating sight. I think fascinating to see and that is where the black mamba name comes from it's got nothing to do with the color of the snake and it is deceptive i can understand why when you hear the name black mamba particularly with the reputation they inspire you might be slightly afraid it's okay guy it's all right it's okay boy but no, the name comes from the inside of their mouth. But their venomous cousins, the green mumbers, which we don't find here, are found more towards the coastal forests. Those green mumbers are called green because they are an electric green. A bit of confusion when these snakes were being named, but the olive gray mamba doesn't sound quite as intimidating as the black mamba. And I think that's why the name is stuck. And if you are confronted with one of these snakes, feeling frightened and threatened, that is the first part that you see. And what I always find incredible is the way that their muscles are constructed, that they can drape themselves comfortably like this one has, all over this tree, all over the branches, and still hold its weight, hold its head up, the muscular structure and the skeletal structure working together to create that typical serpentine motion that we know so well is actually a wonder of nature. To be able to exert that amount of control over their bodies, we chat about it a lot when we talk about the elephant trunk, but sometimes I think maybe we neglect to consider what a beauty of evolution snakes bodies actually are so beautifully adapted oh and just to while i'm on that subject i chatted about pythons now pythons are one and or one type of snake i said that they are one of the older species that we get out here and what i mean by that is that they evolved sooner than snakes like this black mamba and you actually can see on the snake itself on pythons you can actually see residual stumps at the base close to the tail where they used to have legs and it's one species of snake that you can actually as far as i know you can tell the difference between male and female by looking at the size of those stumps so obviously snakes evolved from reptiles like lizards that have legs Snakes have the most extraordinary senses. Every now and again, you'll see his tongue, forked tongue flicker out and test the scent particles. Wondering why he's doing that, he or she. And the answer is very similar to that Fleming grimace. Now we've spoken a lot before about the Fleming grimace in mammals, which is where they go and they test a scent and then they scrunch up their faces and that draws the scent particles into a specialized organ that sits on the roof of the mouth. Now in snakes, that organ is incredibly advanced. So at the top of his palate, he's got an organ known as the organ of Jacobson. And essentially what he's doing when he flickers his tongue out like that, or he or she, is to catch scent particles in the air and actually build up a picture of what's happening around him. It's almost like he can taste and see the smells. So what that's doing is adding to the perception and they've got very sensitive organs of Jacobson. Their senses of smell and taste are phenomenal. They've also got eyes, obviously they don't have external ears, but they do have ways of de detecting vibrations. And what's happening here is his brain is processing all of the information between the taste of the smells, if you can imagine it like that, the heat receptors that are around the snout, his vision, which is not as good as, for example, a bird, except the, the exceptions there are the tree snakes. So wormslungs and vine snakes have exceptionally good eyesight, but for mummers, their main perception of the world 
is in heat reception and smell and scent that they're tasting. Essentially, the snake is building up a picture of its world with its tongue. It's looking at us with its tongue, if you can imagine it like that. <laughs> Hello, Mario. Mario is our, one of our seven-year-old viewers. Mario, are you wondering why the snake is looking at us like it wants to eat us? And you're asking whether or not I'm scared. Mario, I'm not scared because he doesn't want to eat me. He wants to watch me. He wants to make sure that I'm not going to come and attack him. He's scared. He is far more scared than I am. And in fact, once we've finished off with this question, I'm actually going to back off and let him move away comfortably because I think he feels trapped in this tree with us being here and can't quite decide what to do. Mario, I'm far enough away that he can't get me. And snakes don't attack people. They bite people when they get scared and when they get trapped, but they're never gonna come out to try and attack us. We're not on their menu, they don't wanna eat us. So all he wants to do is make sure that I'm not going to shoot out and attack him. Now well, guys, this has been the most phenomenal opportunity to study what is an incredible creature but at this point i think mario's question is right the snake hasn't moved out of this tree so what i'm going to do we'll still stay with him but what i'm going to do is back up so that it can decide where it wants to go and let's see what the decision is made maybe we get to watch it move off completely peacefully but mario no i'm not scared he's not going to come and attack me it's just a matter of knowing a little bit about the way that snakes think and behave. I'm backing up slightly. I want to see what the snake decides to do, but we can actually watch. We do have this incredible camera. We can watch from a, just a more comfortable distance for the snake and see what it decides to do. Let me duck my head down. Let's just have a look. Now we've given it plenty of comfort space. Where did it go? It's there somewhere. In the tree behind. There he is was in the tree because it wanted to be in the tree. Well, I know that we spoke about the various predators and prey species of these snakes. And of course, one thing I didn't touch upon was whether or not they would ever attack each other. Sabrina, I know you wanted to know if there's any snakes that do eat other snakes. And yes, a black mamba could actually quite possibly decide to devour one of the other smaller snake species. Fairly unusual, but it does happen. And there are certain snakes that are quite well adapted towards hunting each other. Now, as for whether or not a king cobra and a mamba, or a mamba could kill a king cobra, um, possibly, I don't think so though. And Joseph, I know you were wondering whether or not a mamba could kill a cobra. Yes, probably. Of course, each snake has a unique venom that they utilize. So although they might be immune to their own venom, I don't think that they carry immunity to other snakes' venom. That being said, it's unlikely that it would ever actually occur. I mean, if they have two snakes of equal size, which is, I assume, what you are thinking along the lines of why take on a threat like that where you could run the risk of being seriously injured when there are other more harmless prey species to target and go after and generally these big snake species are very good at giving each other plenty of personal space i've given him plenty of personal space but he hasn't actually decided to leave the tree which makes me think maybe actually stress over drukwerk nergens vernoot and discovered a nice vantage point 
which makes me feel quite comforted. I'm glad to know that we didn't scare it unduly. I think if we had, and if it was up in that tree because of our presence, I think it would have taken this opportunity to shoot down and onto the ground. Definitely one of my most extraordinary snake sightings. It's not often that we get to spend this amount of time with such amazing creatures. A first for me, and I'm sure a first for most of you as well. There you go, I can see it still looking around with its head. What are you gonna do, buddy? Are you gonna come down? Or are you happy up there? Looks like slowly starting to descend. Our view here, now that I've moved back, is not fantastic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here for a little bit longer and wait until it starts to descend. But for the, in the meantime, let's pop over to Brent, see what he's up to. I believe that he has some elephants to show you. And if anything ch changes, then we'll come right back across here. I see you two sniffing at me. Sorry, I'm in the way there. And as you know how a little beep, 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 I'm just going to turn on the virtual reality rig. That's uh, this little ball of cameras on the, on the left-hand side of the car. You hear all the beep, beep, beep. There we go. And I'm just going to clap quickly. There we go. So there's elephants all around us. There's two having a little tussle over there. Looks like the youngsters just filled with the joy of morning. And a nice little group of babies off to the right. Also having a good little play. Now, that head shake, you heard it, wasn't it us? It's actually, this other female seems to, seems to be upset with this female. It's quite strange behavior here. Very interesting. So she's urinating. And these are really big females. They're very tall at the shoulder, these two. Maybe he's giving a, the other one a bit of a talking to. This is incredible. We are about to be absolutely surrounded by a big herd of eddies. And you can see paying us almost no attention. Just some curiosity from the youngsters, but mostly the, the big adult females here. We go. As I said, curiosity from the little ones. Hello, little one. Uh, the adults are just feeding around us. Oh, get ready. Andrew up front is charging the other one. There we go. Hello. Oh, isn't that sweet? Trunks entwined. Oh, adolescent getting involved. <laughs> Rough and tumble. As you can see, the Ellies are just moving slowly past us. We're going to sit here and just really enjoy this moment. And she's right next to Andrew feeding off a zebra wood. Isn't that incredible? It's probably no more than six feet from Andrew at the moment, completely oblivious to us and just feeding away. And when you're in a situation like this and now we're surrounded by elephants, so if we have to start and move the car, uh, it might set them off. And this is how a lot of people uh, often think they're getting charged by elephants and whatnot. Often if you just sit still, and you can hear I keep the tone of my voice um, very, very calm and down, even though when I get excited when I see an Ellie doing that and start tapping Andrew on the leg, having a, a little bit of fun on that termite mound. And I, I think, there we go. It's a little girl, very playful little female. Look at this little guy climbing. It's so busy, all the little ellies around here. Oh, 
that in there. Oh, isn't that cute? The pointing his nose at us, giving us a smell. And here we go. Here comes a tuskless female. And it looks like she's been born without tusks. Hello, little one. We've got probably about eight, nine-year-old female here, right close to us. Look at that. We're just surrounded by eddies at the moment. So there's a big group. I mean, there's at least 30 or 40 here. And for those of you who are going on safari uh, and driving yourself around Kruger, we'd rather be a little bit more cautious with elephants. Uh, we obviously spend a lot of time with elephants and uh, have a lot of experience in reading their behavior, but it's always better to err on the side of caution. Before I approach an elephant herd, I always watch them from a distance, and their body language always tells you uh, if they are in a good mood or a bad mood. And the same herd on a different day could behave completely differently. Now, a couple of telltale signs to look out for when an elephant's in a bad mood is that uh, they'll open their ears, raise their head. Uh, but one of the really, really, really important signs to look for is their tail. And their tail's hanging nice and loosely like that. They're nice and relaxed. Uh, when the tail starts getting a bit stiff and that, it's a sign of stress and, and that they're not very comfortable. Quite often, Ellie's, even when they are relaxed, when they walk up towards you, they will give you a head shake and whatnot, and that's just sort of letting you know that they're here and that they're big and you shouldn't mess with them. And quite often, if you just sit still, they'll relax down after that. There we go, there's a young bull coming through now. Well, Paul says sometimes he, he swears he can see the Ellie smiling. Well, well, I'm smiling uh, just because this is such a wonderfully relaxed head. Now we see we've got a, a young bull, probably around 20 years old. Now he's showing that very distinct. You see how he's lifting his head a bit higher, opening his ears. What he is is making himself look bigger. Uh, as he walks past us, he might give us a little head shake or not. Oh, very interesting. See that female urinated a little bit earlier. He's now sniffing uh, and tasting her urine. And you'll see that quite often. He's probably testing to see if she's an estrus or and finding out other information. Oh, we're getting stalked by a little male, but he's decided to go off. So, lov lovely bull, also quite a tall bull. We, it's amazing, we've been getting a lot of bulls at the moment, and I love big Ellie bulls. He's not too big yet. There he moves off. He looks like he's heading towards where those, that female that urinated was. This can get a, a bit interesting. Sometimes the females will see off bulls of this age or try and move away from them. You get some of that uh, screaming and yelling, which you get quite often from elephant herds. They've got such a vast array of noise uh, sounds that they make. So the majority of the herd has moved past us. So we've still got some off to the right here and to the left. There we go, there's another one there. Um, and we have noticed, uh, X Rang has noticed that a lot of the smaller eddies are weeping from the temporal gland. Uh, there's quite a few different reasons for this, but it is quite dry at the moment, uh, and they're having to travel big distances between water and food. So it could be a sign of, a little bit of a sign of stress, uh, uh, when elephants start weeping from the temporal gland. Uh, it could be also a sign of uh, hormones changing. So uh, those uh, adults, uh, or those babies getting a little bit closer to adulthood or adolescence, uh, sometimes you'll have quite a lot of weeping from the temporal glands there as well. So it could just be hormones. But most of them are past us. I'm just gonna turn off our little ball of GoPros quickly. Um, and Andrew says, I must clap again. And he wants me to clap multiple times. So if I look like a... Um, uh, an idiot uh, clapping at a uh, non-existent uh, performance. I apologize. Uh, Andrew wants bigger. Are you happy now, Andrew? Yes. There we go, Andrew's happy. Otherwise, apparently, uh, it makes life very difficult for the cameramen and the editors when they start stitching all those footage together.